the realm of alienation, duality, antagonism, representation, and hierarchy. Clearly, the form through which the logic of unalienated and infinite processuality is critically enacted at the moment of theory needs to be conceptualized, not so as to effect the pedagogical and externalized imposition of the concept on another moment, but because that concept could allegorically remind us of the universal logic of unalienated processuality it enacted by way of critically asserting its autonomy in relation to the leaning subjectivity of, once again, alienation, duality, antagonism, and representation in the determinate conditions of theory. That reminder to reclaim or reenact the logic of unalienated processual concrete is necessary, as without that, the opposition to the reading subjectivated centers of alienation, duality, and contradiction at other moments would remain caught in the constitutive antithetical fetish of capitalist duality and logic which emerged through the form of class struggle, uh, duality, and competition. <coughs> Sorry, I'll read this once again. The reminder to reclaim or reenact the logic of unalienated processual concrete uh, is necessary as without that the opposition to the reigning subjectivated centers of alienation, duality and contradiction at other moments would remain caught in the constitutive antithetical fetish of capitalist duality and competition and would fail to become critical. That would also mean the unfolding of the processual revolutionary logic which emerged to the form of class struggle in the theoretical moment has been steamed. Therefore, the concept of academics beyond academia is not a concept in the pedagogical sense, but in the allegorical sense, whereby it is not a concept only by virtue of being one that is self-reflexively indicative of its own subsequent formal negation. So, the knowledge of unalienated singular processual logic of universality which is encapsulated in academics beyond academia, the conceptualized form of class struggle at the moment of canonized academics can only be remembered as that concept so that it can be repeatedly extracted and enacted anew at every other lived concrete moment of capitalist duality and contradiction. It is this dialectical awareness of the concept about itself that is fatally absent from the formulation class struggle in the theoretical moment. For, even as that concept arises, not very differently from our academics beyond academia, to the enactment and affirmation of the logic of autonomous and unalienated processuality in the process of critically negating the subjectivated center of the total system of alienation, duality, hierarchy, externalized determination or representation, and invasive and false objectification of knowledge, it tends to reify the form through which the critical subjectivity of the processual had determinately appeared in the specific moment of theory. As a result, its relation with other historically different moments of capitalist duality and contradiction becomes pedagogical, thereby undermining the entire logic of reclaiming and reenacting the working class subjectivity of the singular universal in a determinate manner. <clears throat> Adorno's formulation that his was the theoretical moment of class struggle, which informed not merely his own political theoretical practice and position, but that of the entire post-war Frankfurt School, clearly illustrates a problem that one wishes to term his and his school's Heideggerian tangle. This problem deserves our special attention because it plagues many of our comrades in the academia who profess to one strain or school of left-wing radical politics or another. They clearly content themselves by restricting their politics of critique to the theoretical moment, even as they refuse to accept the fact that the form in which their critical politics has emerged in the academic moment of theory self-reflexively cries out to be unfolded through reenactment of the constitutive processual logic of that theoretical form of critical politics into the messy moment of political pragmatics, or what some of them label with suppressed derision as mobilizational politics. They usually meet the demands that the moment of political pragmatics, which for them is a realm of irredeemably uncritical and positivist abstraction, they usually meet the demands of the moment of political pragmatics, which for them is a realm of irredeemably uncritical and positivist abstraction, with disengaged pessimism 
and that classically Adorno-esque melancholy. This melancholic quietism of theirs with regard to the moment of pragmatics and political action is nothing but the manifestation of their failed attempt to pedagogically impose the form in which their critical politics emerge in the moment of academic theory. An attempt that would fail, even if it were not to be repelled by the dogmatic pedagogues of party politics and pragmatism, by undermining the entire revolutionary project of continuously unfolding the subjectivity of singular processuality, by reenacting it in a determinate fashion at various other concrete moments of capitalist contradiction. As a matter of fact, this Heideggerian problem of our adornoistly academic Marxists who have come to constitute a silent but rather resilient hegemony in the realm of so-called radical political theory at the academic moment, at least ever since the Soviet debacle, has turned out to be no less noxious than the problem of our dogmatic party bosses and their sundry organizational approaches. The latter have reified and sought to pedagogically impose the form through which the revolutionary subjectivity of unalienated processuality expressed itself at either the Fordist industrial workers location or the agrarian tribal location in the moment of pragmatics, on other locations within the moment of pragmatics or more dangerously on the moment of theory and knowledge, thereby denying it its determinate specificity. The working class struggle is not, is not surprisingly caught today between the rock of chronic quietism as far as the relation as it unfolds from the moment of theory to the moment of pragmatics goes, and the hard place of Stalinist dogmatism as far as the unfolding of the essential relation from the moment of pragmatics to that of theory is concerned. The result for the project of reconstituting a revolutionary theory has, as a consequence, been dismal. Theory, in the specificity of its moment of theoretical practice, has become a deconstructionist game of constantly proliferating pluralities, which certainly talks of power, but means nothing as it refuses to ground that power in the relations among its various configurations of materiality. On the other hand, pragmatics, in the specificity of its moment of various practices, and thus also positing the theories of those various practices, has fallen prey to the tyranny of pragmatism, which has repressed all possibility of constructing a revolutionary theory. The contradiction between the two positions of quietist deconstructionism in the theoretical moment and dogmatic pragmatism in the moment of pragmatics is, as we can see, merely apparent. In reality, they are embedded in the same structure of trans-historical and instrumentalized subjectivity of canonized bourgeois philosophy. Our conceptualization of academics beyond academia is a formalization of the maneuver to dialectically negate and supersede this contradiction. And on this score, one could argue that this project of academics beyond academia has a stronger affinity to Althusser and Alan Badiou's classically Leninist concept of doing philosophy under the condition of politics than the one-sided formulation of Adorno of this being the theoretical moment of class struggle. True, Althusser in his later writings did dub philosophy as a state form, but the question he repeatedly broached to the totality of his political theoretical practice, and which remains even today, the most important political theoretical question for working class politics is, can there be a philosophy in the negative? Something that becomes, for the theoretical moment, the Leninist transition state form. That is, can philosophy be a modality to affirm the unalienated singular processuality implicit in the critical negation of the subjectivated center of the horizon of alienation, duality, contradiction, externalized determination, and hierarchy? <coughs> in other words, can the logic of unalienated processuality be located in a form idiom, ontology, or subjectivity, which has emerged to express its autonomy through critique of the realm of alienation, hierarchy, and representation? Can there be a philosophically affirmative explication and description of what such a form of subjectivity says in terms of why and how it says what it says, and not merely in terms of what it apparently says as a form of subjectivity per se? It is, this constant, it is the constant posing of these questions 
that our project of academics beyond academia is tasked with. For it is this task and nothing else which is the task of revolution today. In that context, we would do well to delineate the exact difference, as far as one can see, between Adorno's critical theoretical idea, critical theoretical idea of class struggle in the theoretical moment, with Althusser's apparently similar project of envisaging the academic discipline of philosophy as a terrain of politics and class struggle. And this one intends to do through a rather schematic comparison between the political theoretical practices and stances of these two luminaries of Western Marxism, 